So I started a car stereo store out of my front yard because I had a tooth break and I had to get my tooth fixed and my father didn't have money and I didn't have money. And so it was either not have my tooth fixed or uh, sell everything I owned and gather up the money to get it fixed. So I put out ads in the local newspaper and in the bargain trader for uh, all of the car stereo equipment that I had bought over, you know, my years when I was a young kid. I think I was maybe 18, 19 at the time. And I discovered that the prices that I was able to get for this stuff were basically what I paid for it, except I bought it two years earlier. And so I said to myself, oh, well, that's easy. If I can sell stuff that's used after two years for the same price I bought it for, I must be getting a really, really good deal. So I said, okay, well, what if I put out ads for stuff that I can get, but I don't have yet? And I had a connection uh, through my father. My father did air conditioning for a guy that, uh, that worked at a big store. And he said, hey, you know, we can give you cost on this stuff. And so like I put out the ads, people would call me, and I would spend all day driving back and forth from this giant store to delivering to people the stuff that they wanted. And then after I did that for, I guess, a couple months, I had enough money to have an inventory. And then I didn't have to drive as often. I could drive maybe once or twice a week. And then after I did that for a while, I was installing stuff in people's cars. And my father was like, look, you know, you're working all, all day and all night. When he gets home from work, he wants to just be able to enjoy his life and not have like customers of mine out front. Uh, so he's like, you know, you got to get a store. And I think, I think my first store was uh, like $1,200 a month, I think. I think it was $1,200 a month rent. And then I had a girlfriend and pops didn't want me, you know, messing around with my girlfriend in the house. And then I was like, all right, well, I guess I'm moving into my store. So, I mean, I moved out of my, out of my dad's house into my first store, 21 years old, I think 20, 21, something like that. So then I lived there and, uh, hired my friends and I was lucky cause I went to a, like a super genius school where everyone was really, really, really smart. Um, I was one of the dumber people in my school and, uh, so I guess I'll tell you about my school. So when I was in elementary school, they pulled me out of class and had me do this test with blocks. And I think I was only in elementary school for maybe two days before they moved me to a different elementary school that was all black. I was one of like uh, six or seven percent white kids there, which is why I talk different than some other white people sometimes because I grew up in a different environment. And uh, in this school, we had a super, 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 super amazing gifted teacher where I learned real science and real creative writing. And it was absolutely fantastic. And it was just a gifted program. And so, uh, while I was at that school, you know, I got like third place in a, in a math tournament thing. It was fifth actually. And then I think I got third place in a writing thing with a story called George, the fish. I didn't want to write the stupid story, but they made me do it. So I was like, oh, what's the dumbest thing I can write about? Okay, what's the dumbest name? I don't like the name George. All right, I'll use George. All right, George the fish. And I just wrote a story about like a, a fish swimming along and seeing something shiny and like taking a bite and then, and then being drug out of the water. And for some reason, my attempt at like making something that I didn't want to do stupid, people liked a lot. And it was at that point that I discovered that people will read into what you've written, things that were not there. And so many authors hear so many great analyses of what they've written. And in reality, they had no intention to write that way at all, but they're like, oh, sure. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. You know, because people are pattern finding machines and they're going to find patterns anyway. So I have a car stereo store. It's working good. And I have a buddy that used to go to a super genius school with me and he made shopping cart software. And then I sold his shopping cart software on eBay as like a, you know, you want to go into the business of like, selling websites. Well, this has an automated website builder and shopping cart and email system and a payment gateway built in and all that stuff. And then, you know, that sold. And then I got into search engine optimization. And at the time you could really just read webmaster world, understand spoken hub, understand page rank. Uh, you know, it, it was, it was the time when the world had transitioned from basically meta tag spamming, which everyone just ignored. Like basically if you put what you want in your meta tags and I was in charge of the engine, I would subtract that from your score because, oh, you want to, you want to rank for these things. Well, therefore 
you're probably going to be shady about it and therefore I have to treat you as like a, an antagonistic actor. And so I would probably penalize people for putting words in their meta tags because all I care about is what other people say about you. So that's what PageRank is. PageRank is what other people say about you. So once I learned how PageRank worked, I started internetmarketingmasters.com, and I think this was 2002. Well, I know it was 2002 because I looked at the Wayback Machine. And we did pay-per-click management on what was, at the time, GoTo, which then changed their name to Overture, and they were in charge of all the traffic for Yahoo, which was huge at the time. And then Google didn't even have a pay-per-click program at the time. Uh, they didn't have AdWords, um, and they didn't have like a bidding engine and all that stuff, and that's where all their money comes from now. So it was a really different world back then. So I learned how to do pay-per-click management. I learned how to do SEO. And we got clients that were successful. We had mortgage clients, we had other clients. And you know, with the mortgages, I went and started my own mortgage company, became a licensed mortgage broker, uh, generated leads, used leads, tried to make a website called leadfeeds.com, which would uh, allow you to bid on leads the same way that people were bidding on clicks, which I thought was a pretty good idea. Had a foreclosure bailout company, sex toy store, miracle cleaner, cash advance loans. Uh, what else? I'm sure I'm missing something. A lot of stuff, right? And on a media side, uh, we had affiliate programs where people would sign up and get paid a commission. And if you join an affiliate program, you market however you want, right? If you're, if you're a guy that uh, has an opt-in email list, great. If you're a guy that does print uh, marketing, great. If you're a guy that does radio, eh, it doesn't really work, but whatever. If you're a guy that uh, you know has other affiliates and wants to be a second tier affiliate, things like that, it worked out really, really well. And uh, yeah, so that worked out great. Had 150 employees, figured I'd move on with my life. So moved down to the third world, bought a mansion, got the shit robbed out of me. Now, if you move to the third world and you get the shit robbed out of you, the worst part about getting robbed isn't just the loss of money, but it's also that they're gonna attack your identity and they're gonna try and talk shit about you and make you not wanna pursue them to get your stuff back. So if someone, for instance, if, if you lend a friend money and he doesn't wanna pay you back, he's not only going to not pay you back, he's gonna tell all your other friends what a piece of shit you are because it fits his narrative that you're a piece of shit so that he can feel better internally about not paying you. And the other people that are in your friend circle are also okay with him not paying you. So the, the mission is to not get robbed. Now, since I've done so much business, I've had every type of robbery you can think of. I've had people looking over shoulders to steal uh, contacts. I've had hard drives go stolen. I've had uh, actual uh, secret service at the office, guns pulled out. I had to pull my gun out. Um, I'll tell that story sometime. It's exciting. Uh, you know, that was over credit card fraud. I've had um, smash and grab, like mace, mace my front office, you know, run with equipment out of the front door. I've had uh, straight up make a copy of my website and compete directly against me and like call my customers. I've had uh, Joe Job. I'll tell you about Joe Job. So if you piss off uh, certain people, like a spammer, a spammer will gather up every piece of personal information he can find about you, and he'll write the most offensive, angering email that he can write, and then he'll send it to all the people that uh, he thinks will respond the most harshly to it, which would be reporters, uh, customer service agents, like what, whatever people really don't like spam, right? So this happened to me. Some guy d took all the information that he could find and then uh, spammed out my name and you know my information along with it to try and create problems for me. And here's the funny part. The public and probably some of you guys watching are so fucking stupid that you believe that guy. You're like, yeah. Yeah, this looks good. I've never ever seen an email with anyone's personal contact information all in it before, but this one, this one looks good. Stupid motherfuckers. I had another guy who I, I started supporting charity. I've been trying to like support longevity anti-aging charities forever because 200,000 people a day die from it, which is more than like anything else. And so I did this video for the Methuselah Foundation 
which was, uh, you know, trying to get people to live longer. And someone just straight made a copy of the video and then in the text put, Richard's a piece of shit, scumbag. No, no data, like don't, not why is Richard a scumbag or, or who are all of Richard's victims, none of that stuff, because there aren't any, right? Like that, that leap of logic would require someone to think. But apparently if you're an asshole and you just want to defame somebody or libel them, it's too hard to come up with a compelling like story with like verbs in it. So basically the content is Richard sucks, sucks is an adjective, but then there's no verb. Like what, why does Richard suck? Silence, right? But the internet is so goddamn stupid that they look at stupid bullshit written by criminals to try and make me look bad. And they're like, yep, I believe this. What? So on the internet, if you scam somebody, you know what there's no shortage of? People reporting the scam and being very pissed off about it. Very pissed off. And the people that are very pissed off say their name, say why they're pissed off, and say who they're pissed off at. Very, very simple, right? Take Butterfly Labs. How many people were upset at Butterfly Labs? Lots. Could you find these people? Yes. Would they tell you why they were mad? Yes. Okay. How many people are mad at Richard? Nobody. Okay, who's Richard stolen from? How much Richard does money? Uh, how much money does Richard want from you? That's crickets, right? I don't want your money. You can't give me your money if you want to. I've been living an honest fucking life for a really long time, giving people what they want and making them happy. But the internet's such a bunch of player-hating scumbags that uh, if it fits their narrative, they'll believe fucking anything.